An Abandoned Town by Ivan X. To this day, I consider this to be one of the strangest things I have ever experienced in this lifetime. This happened a couple of years ago. My friends and I were heading to a music festival by Lake Okeechobee in Florida. We are from Miami, so the drive was pretty decent. The only issue is that we'd have to drive through Central Florida. These are, for the most part, secluded towns and swamp areas. Maybe an hour into the drive, my friend, who was in charge of the GPS, told us that there was an accident up ahead, which was going to add time to the drive. However, there was another route which is a little more secluded, so we wouldn't be stuck in traffic, at the very least. We agreed to take this secluded route since we always wanted to get to the festival on time and early enough to be able to secure our campsite and all that fun stuff. Once on this road though, everything felt off. Like we had stepped into another time period altogether. It felt like we were in the middle of nowhere. There is no single car on sight, no landmarks, no mile indicators, just a road that spans for miles and miles of darkness surrounding us. Welcome to Central Florida, brother. <laughs> then, up ahead, we finally started to see buildings. All four of us sighed with relief. Nobody had said anything in the car, but I could tell we had all been tense or worried about this road trip. We entered this town, which I could only describe as a town straight out of the 1950s. It seemed like a movie set or something like that more than an actual town. But here's the worst part. Abs everything, absolutely everything was turned off. Mind you, it's different than when we passed by late at night. It must have been nine-ish latest, but every single light in this town was turned off. Cars were parked everywhere, but only some were out and about. And then, honestly, the, the driver of the car was saying, Yo, what is going on? Where is everyone? And I'm so glad I wasn't alone when this happened. I have other people who experienced this with me, and I still can't explain it. I wish I could have taken pictures of this place, but I promise you guys, it all seemed fake. Every single part of this town was empty, with old-timey police cars and all that kind of stuff, but nobody was inside any of them. It was like a ghost town, completely suspended in time. I know it's probably nothing supernatural, but it was creepy. My Creepy Walking Experience by Dapper Hunt 2171 Tonight I went on a walk with my dog, the same route, same time that I always do. I was walking my normal path, and this part of the walk happens to be the darkest part. There's an alley to the left that was absolutely no light. My dog was suddenly on high alert and was barking like crazy. I had my headphones in, but I knew something was wrong, and I looked down the alley but didn't see anything at first. When my eyes adjusted to the dark, I saw a very tall, skinny man standing there. He didn't move, he was just facing me, staring from what I could tell. He was in all black. His pants and shirt were long, which is weird because it had to be 90 to 100 degrees all week. Not to mention it was 10.30 at night, and this man was wearing a giant black sun hat. I kind of froze and went, uh, pretty loudly as I turned my headphones off so I could listen in. The man was standing there saying absolutely nothing, and now I'm turning toward him but walking forward. After a second of him being silent and me trying to walk away, kind of chalking it up to a creepy but harmless encounter, he starts to follow me. This man followed me for about two to three minutes saying absolutely nothing, just staring at me. When I felt like I could speak, I yelled out, my dog's going to freaking bite you. That seemed to scare him a bit because after he slowly started falling behind and then stopped following me entirely after about 30 seconds. He slowly went onto the sidewalk and went a different way. When he turned around to get away, he had a huge backpack on. It was extremely full. I have a really uneasy feeling about this. I go on this path in my small town almost every single night, and this man just so happens to be standing there in the darkest alley. There's been three women that have gone missing recently, and I kind of feel like maybe I'm putting dots that might not be there, together, but maybe this has something to do with their disappearances.
Small Town Creep by Anonymous. This happened many years ago when I was 15 years old. I'm also a female if that means anything. I lived in a small Midwestern town that had very little crime and I always felt pretty safe even at nighttime. I lived just a few blocks away from downtown and would often walk or ride my bike there to pick up some soda, some candy, or on this particular evening, a pack of cigarettes. So I get my cigarettes and started walking back home. By this time, it is starting to get dark out, but that doesn't really bother me. That is until I pass a cross street and a guy steps out from the shadows and starts following me. Even then, I wasn't really too terribly scared just aware he was walking behind me and getting closer. I sped up a little and so did he. Pretty soon this guy is in like three or four steps behind me and asks me for a cigarette. Being a dub kid who was raised to be polite, uh, I gave him one. Then he asked for a light and I gave him that too. Then I rapidly started walking away because this guy is starting to give me the absolute heebie-jeebies. He had long greasy hair and the way he looked at me made me feel very uncomfortable. It was like he was looking at his dinner plate and deciding what to eat first. So I'm skedaddling up the street, which is now going uphill when I hear the guy's footsteps starting to run towards me. I was already slightly out of breath from walking fast up this hill, and now I'll never be able to outrun this guy, so I just keep on walking and hope this guy will jog right past me. Nope. Next thing I know, the guy has grabbed me from behind with one arm around my waist, pinning both my arms to my sides, and then another around my neck. At this point, I wasn't even scared. I was more mad. How dare he? I realize that we are on the residential street, so I tell the guy I'm going to start screaming my head off if he doesn't let go of me instantly. He hesitates for a moment, then lets me go and jogs further up the hill, disappearing behind a bush at the top of the hill. I crossed the street to walk on the opposite side of the bushes he went behind and keep my eyes locked in those bushes all the way down the block. By now, I am the only other person on this street. I'm only another block away from home and I break into an absolute sprint. Of course, I never told my parents about what happened because I was afraid of getting in trouble for smoking and that they wouldn't let me be free anymore, if that means anything. Turns out that several weeks later, this guy grabbed another girl, beat and raped her. I didn't find this out until years later when I saw his picture in the paper for being on trial for the, you know. I think it was his first attempt and he got scared and when I was being a little bit more, you know, feisty than he expected, he just gave up. I'm so thankful that that's how this happened. A Farm Story by Anonymous I had only met my grandfather once before we moved in. I think I was around seven or so, I don't quite remember much from that time. When my mom and my dad passed away, I tried to take away that part of my life entirely. Eric and I were left with no other family but an aunt. She was living overseas, so mom's dad was the only remaining option. Grandpa Mac lived on a 500 acre farm in the southeastern part of Montana. He had been raising sheep there since immigrating from Scotland in the 1930s. When we arrived, it was lambing time. Neither of us knew what to do, but Mac was a patient teacher. We caught on fast. We had no real choice, to be honest. Any day we had a little free time, Mac took us hunting or fishing. Season meant little to him. He'd follow most game laws, but if he saw a big buck, he'd take it. It was his land, after all. Nobody was going to tell him what he could or could not do as far as he was concerned. Pretty much as far as I know, we never really had any trouble, but this was in the 1960s. It may have helped us to be friends with the game warden. The initial spring was my first time ever seeing a grizzly. We'd run into one on our way up to the river. Even from 50 yards away, it was, it was definitely scary, and the power that it held was evidence. Its size awed me. One quick swipe with its giant paws could have ripped a tree in half. No warning to stay away would be needed. Neither Eric nor I wanted any trouble from one of those monsters. Mac led us away down a new path. I wouldn't see another for almost three years. A hungry male had caught an ewe out on its own. When Mac found the body, he knew well what had to be done. 
He grabbed his rifle and sadly he had to end his favorite horse Penny's life. I was left to guard the remaining flock while he was away. I drove the truck out into the pasture. Eric rode in the back with Max 3030 as I patrolled the field. No more than 45 minutes passed and I caught sight of a grizzly ahead. I gunned it. We got about 50 or 60 yards away and I told Eric to shoot. The first shot hit him but I think it only made him mad. He roared at us and I told Eric to keep on shooting. He dumped five or so more rounds into him before he fell. The great brute fought bravely but was no match for the marlin's power. The beast may have appeared dead but I told Eric to stay in the truck. We had not been watching for long when Matt came over the hill. He slowed as he got closer, watching the motionless bear himself. He dismounted and drew his mauser from his sheath on the side of the horse's saddle. I held my breath as he inched closer to the beast. When he poked the bear with the rifle, he was within spitting distance. Once, twice, thrice, but nothing. The monster had been indeed slain. A 13-year-old boy had fallen one of Mother Nature's greatest predators. Once I was sure it was safe to breathe, I ran to the grizzly, Eric right behind. Mac's work-worn face wore a smile, the first and last I can remember ever seeing from him. I'm not sure I believe it, but I surely see it. Well, you're sure a man now, boy. The remnant of a Scottish brogue bled through. Despite slight pangs of jealousy, I congratulated my little brother. Mac jestingly messed up his hair and shook his hand. If I had known this day would be a high point of our time with Mac, I perhaps would have savored it just a bit more. Since everything we did was a learning opportunity, Mac drew his knife and gave us a lesson on butchering grizzly in the field. The three of us carried the meat and hide back to the truck and tossed them into the bed. While Mac brought his horse into the stable, I drove the bear bits to the house. For most of that spring, we ate grizzly in every way possible. It is undoubtedly an acquired taste. I've had a coastal brown bear in Alaska before and the flavor proved far too fishy for me. Our bear was much more to my palate. I don't think Eric liked it much, but you ate what you were given when you lived at Max. Besides, I think it made him proud to provide such a large kill for us to eat. Life would continue much as it had through summer and into the winter. That year's winter was terrible. The blizzard of 1969 is still spoken of today around Montana. Things were tough, but Mac wasn't about to let a little snow beat him. We were all delighted to see that the thaw was finally arriving. Our hands were full with the lambing, but when we had some, Mac drove us out to the river for fishing. The trout were biting like crazy and we soon became separated. I never got the full story from him, but I believe he witnessed most of what happened. We all knew there were grizzlies in the area. Fish is one of their favorite food, and Eric and I had become accustomed to watching out for them by this time. I have no doubt that that morning, both creatures just stumbled upon one another. If you run into a female grizzly with her cubs in tow, she will attack. It's undoubtedly possible a fishing rod could look like a rifle to a bear. No matter what she was thinking, Eric never had a chance. Mac was the only one carrying a weapon, and it was already too late to do any good. He had only gotten off a few shots, but I think her having cubs along with his aim being a bit wide, perhaps even then, he was reluctant to make those cubs orphans. Sure, Mac was definitely all torn up about what he had seen, but I don't think he blamed that sow for how she reacted. The water was much too loud for me to hear the attack. The gunshots were the first thing that got my attention, to be honest. The haunting wail that soon followed. That's when I knew something terrible had happened. When I reached the scene, Max sat holding Eric in his arms, crying and moaning. Just the sight of this caused me to buckle. Soon, I too was wailing and screaming, cursing God for taking my little brother. I begged and bargained. In the end, it made no difference. I had a large hole inside me for a long time. But Mac, I think he died that day. I don't recall much of the rest of that afternoon. Dark was coming on when the sheriff showed up at the house. Eric was laid out on the table. I greeted him and his deputies at the door. Mac sat silently at the table alongside Eric's battered body. I led them into the kitchen. The sheriff talked to Mac, paying his respects and the like. I don't think he heard a word of it. Once the sheriff saw the body for himself, any doubt he had was gone. He left us alone to grieve, but the outside world kept butting in. A new person was calling every minute, offering their condolences. A few of the surrounding farmers even showed up. All that pity quickly became suffocating. I tried my best to be courteous to everyone, but without Mac to help, I got overwhelmed. 
I finally just started asking folks to go away. Most were understanding. It would eventually get quiet around 10.30. I made for bed not long after. Before I did, I stuck my head into the kitchen and bid Mac goodnight. He was in the process of cleaning the mess from Eric's body. He didn't bother to answer. Briefly, I considered telling him to leave that to the funeral home, but reconsidered. He needed to do it, and I didn't want to take it away from him. In the days leading up to the funeral, little was said. Mac would speak, but it pained him. Things still got done, but I think it was more out of habit and necessity than desire. When the funeral came from Mac, I could tell Mac had a hard time letting go. He would spend all day in his room, occasionally talking. I would assume to Eric. Although the ranch hands didn't mind one bit picking up the slack, I was concerned for his sanity. For me, work and school were saving grace. It kept my mind off things. If I had sat and dwelled on things all day, I would have become unwound in short order. In my opinion, Mac let himself feel too much, too fast. Ultimately, this story may be more tragic than horrifying, but bear attacks, wild animal attacks, etc. are all very real very terrifying and happen all the time. I miss my brother every single day, but I can tell you something. I am not afraid of the woods and I am not afraid of any bears. I run alongside them all the time and try to co-inhabit. It's not their fault. We just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and nature took its course. Before we start this first story, I just wanted to give you all a quick disclaimer that there are some notes of assault in this story, and if that is a trigger or bothers you, feel free to use the timestamps in the description or pinned comment to skip to the next story. This was back in the 1980s. I'm a female that was born in 1975, and I was born and raised in Virginia. When I was young, I was physically, mentally, and other ways abused by different members of my immediate family. We lived in a two-story house, and my room was the only room with an AC unit in the window. My room closet was at the end of the attic that started in the laundry room on the bottom floor. This is how people got to me quickly. It came to the point that I would be so scared to sleep that I would put a butcher knife under my pillow lock my bedroom door, and put heavy boxes in front of my closed closet door so I would be ready if somebody tried to attack me at night. One night, before my 10th birthday, I peacefully slept in my room. I heard my floor squeak, which it did only when someone walked on it. I sat up and clung to my knife to see who was there, but no one was there, and the doors were shut, and the boxes stood still. I clutched the knife and shortly fell back to sleep. A bit later I heard my floor again, but this time I had sunk into my covers and was scared to move. Something inside me felt a peace come over me, and I peeked over my covers. A man standing in front of me looked oddly like my dad, but was sober, glowing and smiling at me. He looked towards my bedroom door and put his hand on my bed, but I did not feel it. A strange feeling came over me, and I finally fell asleep again. I told my aunt about what I saw and she didn't believe me. A few nights later I was asleep again, but this time my door was opened because I had assumed I'd be okay because everyone was asleep before me. I remember waking up once as I slept because I heard someone come into my room. At about the same time I closed my eyes and the man was standing next to me, almost holding me down, putting his finger to his lips as if to tell me to be quiet. I quickly felt at peace and fell back to sleep. The following, day, the, police... the following day, the police asked me what I saw. Someone had broken into our house the night before, and according to the mud prints, they had walked into my room before leaving. They got away with all the money my parents had. When they found my dad's wallet and mom's purse, they also found a gun with three bullets inside. Was the man there to keep me safe? I barely remember July 10th's birthday. I remember my radio was thrown down the stairs and I remember my cousins left early. She later told me I was poorly beaten until I was knocked unconscious. I remember that man caressing my head as I drifted to sleep. A little while later I dreamt about a plane show and a German World War II fighter was doing tricks, but something went wrong and 103 people standing nearby were injured and the pilot was killed in the crash. I told my dad about it and he told me it must have been a movie I saw. The next day we watched a plane show and exactly what happened in my dream happened in real life. Both of us were amazed. 
In 1985, I was sent to live with a foster family while my family found help. They moved to Ohio but asked the judge if I could help care for the kids during the summer of 1987. I had a fantastic summer. The man returned to me a few nights before leaving but went quickly. I mentioned it to my foster mom, but she told me to pray the next time I saw him. The night before I was supposed to leave, we stayed with her parents in Michigan. The plane was supposed to leave the following day, routed to Newark, New Jersey, and then to Virginia State. In New Jersey, I would get off the plane and go to another to get back to Virginia. As I slept, I saw the man again. He played games, hugged me, and even showed me he likes to work puzzles. During the night, I dreamt that there was a plane that crashed and the 268 people on board were all killed. A three-year-old little girl was the only survivor. Her grandmother and mom were driving on a back road when a wing flew off and hit them. The ladies were killed instantly, and so was everyone on board. My man suddenly changed his demeanor. He seemed more angry than sad, and started searching the rubble. I woke up in a sweat and told my foster mom what happened. She just told me to focus on the rumbling of the thunder and go back to sleep. I did. At 10 a.m., she woke me up and told me the storm had knocked out all the power in the neighborhood. My plane was scheduled at 8. As we drove to the airport, there was debris everywhere. They had white sheets covering up things they found all over the roads. There were way too many ambulances to count and police. I started to cry because it was too much stress to think about. I was two hours late for my plane, and there was death all around me. When we got to the airport, the manager on the floor grabbed my foster family and hurried us to a closed room. He explained that the flight was full, but one person didn't board me. He said my flight went up on time and then went down a few minutes later, killing everybody. The news never mentioned the storm, but my foster family knew it had happened. It was the only storm to hit this side of Michigan at that time. I told the man about my dream, and he said there was another crash he had gotten wind that a wing from the plane flew off and hit a family in a car on the side of the road. Before I boarded another flight, I learned only a three-year-old girl survived. It was too devastating. I stayed with my dad and sister when I returned to Virginia. While there, she asked me to help her clean up the attic. This was the first time I'd ever been there, and I felt uneasy as I started picking up random old pictures off the floor. There he was. In the picture, my man was holding a baby girl in 1932. It was my aunt. I told my aunt this was my man and she told me to see my grandma. My grandma looked at the photo for a while, then she told me about the firstborn girls on her side of the family who saw and felt things that no one else could understand. She also said to me that the man in the photo was her first husband, who was my dad's father. He died when I was eight years old in Texas. She wondered if he was sent to me to help keep me safe when I needed it most. The last time I saw him was the end of May. I dreamt that my dad drank himself to death and he gave me a big hug and walked out towards a cemetery. I remember feeling very sad and lonely. Two weeks later, my husband, aunt, and I found my dad in his living room dead, exactly the way in my dream. My aunt and I felt that there was someone or something else in that room with us. Later she told me that she felt as if someone had hugged her. I thought so too. And later, she told me she felt as if someone had hugged her. I thought so too. Finally, my grandfather and my dad were together again, and these are the moments in time I will not forget too easily. My grandmother was right. I know when someone is about to die, or when something's going to happen, and my oldest daughter has the same feelings. My Mother's Nursing Home Stories by Steven Universe X2 My mom used to tell me about this encounter when I was younger, and it was always so cool to me. She said this encounter is what made her believe in ghosts and spirits. So back in 2006, my mom worked at a nursing home. This nursing home specializes in geriatric care rather than just assisted living. It was sometime around lunch, and she and another nurse were moving some residents to the basement, where the feeding room was. These residents could not feed themselves, 
so that the nurses would have to feed them in that room. This was the original hospital in town, but it got repurposed over time. She brought the first resident down, a blind man who was wheelchair bound and wheeled him to his spot. She noticed that four chairs were around a table, like a group had been sitting there. Not really thinking about it, she pushed the chairs up and leaves to bring the next resident. As she got to the elevator, she passed the other nurse with the second resident. This is important for later. Once she had retrieved the third resident, she once again met the nurse at the elevator in the basement. They kept this pace up the whole time. My mom wheels the third resident in and sees the chairs back out in the same position she had found them the first time. She thought it was weird and returned them after she wheeled the resident to their spot. By this time, three residents were blind and wheelchair bound. She goes back up to get another resident and heads into the basement, passing the nurse as she does so. She walks in and the chairs are back out. She wheels the resident into their spot and again puts the chairs back. She stood there perplexed for a little bit longer this time, so the pace she and the nurse had was broken. The nurse walked in with another resident. She must have seen the perplexed look on my mom's face where she was looking. She asks if the chairs are back out around the table. As it turns out, the other nurse had also been putting the chairs up from around the table. Somehow, in a room of disabled people who cannot even lift a spoon on their own, four chairs had been pulled off the stack and into the same positions at the table. My mom later found out that there had to be a ghost, and his name had been Hank, and apparently he had been in the basement, whom the other staff were just kind of chilling about. He doesn't seem harmful, but his place is at the basement feeding room. Interestingly enough, I believe the room was a repurposed morgue and office type thing. The conjoining room still had the autopsy table, but the room had been turned into a storage room by then. Nightmares or Premonitions by Naruto Hinata I am kind of freaking out, but basically, I have had two nightmares, or maybe even premonitions. I don't really want to go into too terribly much detail, but I felt the need to cleanse my room. So I closed my door, not all the way, just kept a crack open and opened my window and started watching my room, saying any negative energies are not welcome and must leave. Then, I think whatever it was, was gone through my door because my door opened by itself just a smidge, and then tonight, when I tried to sleep, I felt like there was a hand on top of my head. I even felt what felt like fingernails. I have been doing candle spells to manifest protection, love, and light, and I was telling my guides I wanted to be a medium, which would definitely was a lousy idea now that I think back on it. Still, I regret saying that I had nightmares before even saying that, and I have had a white candle on top of my mirror tray with a selenite and some rose quartz crystals. I have lavender and salt on there, but I don't know, I feel like I did something wrong, and I'm kind of freaking out. Also, I felt nothing wrong then, when I felt the hand on me. I was just surprised and not expecting it. But a couple of hours later, I got a very bad stomach ache, like a bad feeling and nausea. Please tell me how to cleanse my house properly if anybody in the comments knows. Any advice would be greatly appreciated. I've been listening to music and keeping my vibrations high, but my cats also keep running around looking at something I cannot see. Luckily, I haven't heard them hissing or anything, but I don't know if that means terribly much. Also, these dreams started a bit after talking to some guy online. He said he was praying for my good health, but my gut feels like maybe he wasn't. It's just now sickening as I'm finishing this, feeling awful, feeling nauseous. The mirror tray that I got from the dollar store is the worst nightmare that I ever had. For some reason, there's like a druid or something protecting it. But anytime I talk to it, it says it's a demon. So I'm confused, but I don't feel any lousy energy when I'm necessarily next to the mirror, but I don't know. Hopefully this makes sense to somebody. The Stalker by Anonymous I was 16 years old when this happened. My friends, I'll call them Evan and Jake, and I, wanted to rent a hotel room for the night since it was spring break. We got to the hotel and checked in. It had a funky smell, but we would stay there and make do. Once we got to our room, it was sometime around 3pm, 
so we decided to go swimming. The pool was just downstairs, and we departed from the room. Once we got to the entrance, there was a man at least six foot three in all black and a hood covering his face. He was just standing there facing us. I panicked a little, but not too loud. We got into the pool and swam for a few hours until we saw that man sitting on a chair by the poolside again, in the same garbs. I cleared my throat. Can, can I help you, sir? I asked. I got no response. I'm still a little paranoid. I put my face in the water, and at the bottom of the pool, I see what I think is another black figure. I screamed like a little girl and ran for the door. I looked back and saw absolutely nothing. Not the guy in the chair or the person under the pool. My friends thought I was just seeing things out of paranoia, but I know I saw what I saw. It was, it was as clear as water. I no longer felt like swimming, so I had dinner at a nearby restaurant. I got a table for my friends and myself to sit at, and there, once again I saw the man, all in black, all on the other side of the dining room, staring at me. Now at this point I have had enough. I went over there and lost track of him, so he must have taken off. After we had been there for some time, I decided this trip had gone too far and we should leave tomorrow morning, but my friends really weren't a fan of that idea. Once it was 10.30, my friends and I dozed off in the hotel room. I woke up to some strange noises, and I saw a shadow person at the end of my bed. I calmed myself down and told myself it had to just be sleep paralysis, I was just freaking out. I went to bed and woke up again 30 minutes later to more noises. I was getting thirsty so I reached under my bed and tried to grab my water bottle. And I was caught by something that has shocked me. What I grabbed was a hat. I was never more scared in my life. I couldn't help but scream at the top of my lungs and I heard a voice say right next to my ear, You're dead. I jumped out of bed and realized there was two men in black right there. I tried to fight them but it was no use once they grabbed me and dragged me out of that room. I tried to scream, but one of them were covering my mouth. I passed out and later woke up on a stretcher. It turned out these guys knifed me while I passed out, and someone caught them, but the doctor said no one could see the guys who got me. I've always had a nightlight at night, so now I'm just extra paranoid and have multiple of them. I'm just glad I survived, but I still don't know what their intentions were. Well, aside from killing me. Horror in the City by The Dwarf G I should mention that I previously lived in a tiny town but attended high school in a considerably larger city. I never had a reason or the nerve to go out in the city on my own, so when my two friends wanted to hang out around town, I was nervous to say the least. However, I thought, what the hell? Why not? I'll be with them. What's the worst that can happen? We had a blast for a couple of hours after school, with some small scary incidents along the way, including walking through a store full of expensive statues and gemstones with a massive backpack protruding from my back. The original restaurant we wanted to go to was closed, forcing us to Subway. However, as it got darker, we all knew we had to get home, so we all enjoyed one last store and went on our separate ways. I waited outside the store, alone, in the dark, unafraid. Yet. I had told my mother where to find me, but she was hopeless with directions, so I had expected to be hanging around for just a while. I noticed a news camera stationed outside the store, which made me feel even safer. But about 10 minutes into the wait, I was approached by two men. My memory is fuzzy due to how freaked out I was, but this is what I remember. Hey, do you know where the name of some town that I can't remember is? I shook my head no. I was already nervous because I'm a paranoid person on the best of days, and this was not turning out to be the best of days. Huh, <laughs> come on, one man coaxed. Listen, we'll give you a bag of jewelry if you help us, the other man said. Now I was genuinely freaking out. I glanced around and noticed the news camera and stepped a little closer to the line of sight of the lens. L listen, I stammered, trying hard not to stammer or show how freaked out I was. I think it's that way and I don't need anything, I said pointing in a random ass direction. They glanced in the direction of my finger. They glanced back. Can you show us? Again, we have a big bag of jewelry. I felt as if my heart had leapt into my throat. No thank you, and my mom is coming to get me any second now. I declined as calmly as possible. 
They stared at me for a few seconds, then nodded, thanking me and heading off in the direction I pointed at. I kept well inside of the news camera until my mom picked me up. I didn't really relax or anything like that for at least a full week. I have no idea why they were so eager to give me that bag of jewelry. My first thought was that they stole it and wanted to throw the police off their trail by handing some of it off to me. The second was that they were trying to lure me away with the jewelry. Either way, it would have ended poorly for me if that was their goal. No one has ever really believed me about this, but I don't really expect them to. Ever since, I have never really felt comfortable in the city alone, in the dark, even though it's been multiple years now. And I now live in a decently sized city for college. I grew up in a very safe area for most of my young life. It was one of those neighborhoods where all the kids knew each other and often stayed out well after dark in the summers to play flashlight tag or search. Our biggest concern was calling our parents to let them know we would be sleeping over at our friend's house. I mention all of this to understand how terrifying my mother's story was to a relatively sheltered 16-year-old me. My mother was and remained one of the most muscular women I have ever known. She survived decades of mental, emotional, and I suspect in her early years physical abuse from my sociopathic father. When he tried to prevent her from getting away by refusing to help cover college expenses, she moved out and paid every cent independently. When a drunk redneck attempted to assault a friend of hers in a way that's not so good for YouTube, she gave him a hard right hook and dropped that pile of human garbage. And if people ever threatened her kid's safety, God help them. That woman would make Mama Grizzlies look friendly. So as you might imagine, I never thought anything could scare this woman. But now I understand that even the bravest person can fear for their survival when monsters come out of the shadows. This takes place around 1985 in my home state of South Carolina. My parents had only been married for about two years, both very excited and determined to make something of themselves. They didn't have much money back then and rented a tiny apartment until they could save enough to buy a house. My mom hated that apartment, precisely the large window in their bedroom that people from the street could easily see into. They wanted to put up curtains, but there were no rods and the landlord was a cheapskate who threatened to keep their deposit if they even put a dent in the wall. It annoyed them that they couldn't even have privacy in their own home, but they decided to ignore it since it was a short-term lease this would be a very big mistake. Never ignore your gut. This open window would cause mom to have nightmares for years after. And now, let me tell you about how a murderer first targeted my mom as a potential victim. My mom was an avid runner and a competitive cross-country athlete through high school and college. So, she often went for three or four mile long runs in the evenings to clear her mind after work. She was running in a rural area with few houses and a little traffic on the road. It was an area that high schools like to use in the fall for track and cross-country training. She was out in early summer, so there were no students or other runners around. She liked the quiet and kind of mentally drifted off for a bit. As an old brown-colored car with tinted windows came up behind her, she moved off the road to let them pass. The car seemed to be going past her. The windows were even with her, and then it slowed down. The vehicle stayed this way for about 10 minutes or so, never speeding or slowing, only staying a few feet behind her. My mom realized this person had bad intentions and knew her life was potentially in danger. Worse, there was no one around who could help. She had to make a quick decision, so she sprinted off into the field next to her, thankfully finding a small ditch lined with several thick bushes. She crawled into the largest one and laid flat on her stomach to hide. The car had tried to follow, but the curb had hindered the back wheels. The person attempting to gun it, but the car would not go forward. They were able to reverse it and get back on the road. They drove up the road several times, most likely trying to see if they could spot my mom. After five or six passes, they gave up and drove off. Mom was so scared she barely remembered to breathe, shaking and crying, waiting for this malicious person to get out of the car. Thankfully, they never did. After waiting 30 minutes and no sign of the car, she returned to her apartment as quickly as she could. My dad was home at the time and shocked to see her state. She told him what had happened and wondered if they should call the cops. My dad promised her he would take care of it and told her to take a long warm shower so she could relax. After all, this was home and he would never let anyone hurt her. 
Mom took that shower and started feeling better when she looked out their bedroom window. I think you can guess what she saw parked just outside. It was the same car. Utterly terrified, she screamed and my dad came running. She pointed out the car and he lost it. He bolted out of the apartment and ran towards the car, shouting that he would kill them if they even thought about touching his wife, just to let you know. My dad was about 5'10 and thin as a rail, friendly and always ready to give a helping hand. He was not an intimidating figure to most people, but that day, my dad showed that animal side of him. He showed this creep that he would do whatever it took to protect his family. The car immediately backed up, tires squealing as the man booked it. My parents later called the cops and told them everything. Unfortunately, there wasn't much they could really do but ask questions, basically, since there was no actual physical attack. All they could do was make a note and advise my mom not to run for quite some time. The way they said it made it seem as if she was the problem. They grudgingly accepted this and moved to a new place shortly after. No deposit was worth their lives. A few months passed and reports of multiple young women going missing followed by two murders brought closure to this story. My mom recognized the car the murderer was driving. It was the same one that had stalked her. What made her blood run cold was the picture of his victims. All young, blonde, blue-eyed women who could have been her sisters. Over the years, I've googled the victims and it's shocking how they looked just like her. Down to how they styled their hair. According to the FBI profiler who went on to write the book that inspired Mindhunter, this man was one of the most vicious and sadistic killers he had ever dealt with. Maybe the most evil one in his career. After reading about how he would torture the families and make those poor girls write a last will before murdering them, I'm inclined to agree. For anyone wondering, you can learn more about this sick guy and his crimes by googling Larry Jean Bell. These occurrences take place in my new home in South Carolina. For some backstory, it was the year 2006 when I moved into my current home. I used to be an avid outdoorsman. I used to, anyway. Yesterday, while out on one of my daily hikes during the evening, I found an old, rotting note. After reading this note, I highly doubt I'll be back to those woods for a long while. The note read, I was out with a few friends for a get-together for a friend of mine. He was going to leave for college in a week, so everyone wanted him to go out with a bang. We were having this get-together in some private property that one of my friends, my few friends were Brandon, Kyle, Alfred, and myself, we used this property to drive around the ATVs and dirt bikes we owned. We drank for a while quite carelessly. Eventually, one of us had the idiotic idea to ride our ATVs around to make the effects of being heavily intoxicated even more extreme. I sluggishly went along. Someone had to be able to watch and make sure nothing happened to them, but it had to be me. I had drunk the second least to Brandon. I was basically completely sober. As we drove further, a sound that I could not describe to this day began to become more prevalent as we went further into the woods. The sound became so overpowering at one point that it covered up the loud noise of our bikes. Eventually, we were all on the ground screaming and covering our ears in pain and torment. No matter which direction we ran, even out of the woods, the sound would still grow louder. At this point, the sound became clear to me that it was most likely a scream. Then I saw something that I will never forget. I saw these, what I can only describe as animals. They looked like pale, light gray humanoid type creatures. They had to have stood at least four feet at the shoulder. Their heads had borne the charges of dogs, but the teeth were tiny, blood red knives. The screaming noise had ceased to stop. Then, there was one creature that stood out from the other eight. This one stood about six feet tall at the shoulder. He had a much more muscular build than the others who looked malnourished. His mouth was wide open, still bearing those sharp, long needle-like teeth. But the biggest one, which I supposed was the leader, made a different noise. I could only describe this noise as a clicking noise. It may be necessary to mention that I have the most powerful build of all four of us. After my friend had been dragged away so inhumanly fast, I, I couldn't run that fast if my life depended on it, but at this point it did. 
but while my friends and I were being dragged away, I realized something. The screaming had stopped. After about two or three miles, there was a pit of bones from different animals, but the most common were human bones. The stench was so nerve-wracking that I eventually passed out. When I woke up, my friends were already dead. After seeing the bodies of my friends being eaten by the creatures, I will never be the same. The screaming stopped when the animals had something in their mouths. The screaming almost drove me insane. I resorted to feeding the creatures all my family, friends, and pets. All the people I know are gone. My family, friends, and even my pets are gone. I think the police are beginning to understand what is going on now. They have been showing up at my house more and more lately. The screaming won't stop. I have nothing to feed them except for myself. This is my suicide letter before I jump into the place where I keep the creatures away from all society. Anyone who finds this note, please drop the note now and run. I don't want anyone else to suffer my fate. Now, for whatever reason, I believe that this note is truly genuine more and more by day. A strange screaming noise has been coming closer to my home every night that I keep hearing. I, I, I don't know how much longer I'll be able to live here. Every night they just get a little bit closer and a little bit closer. With my trusty revolver at my side tonight, I will most likely not be able to sleep. The sounds that I hear at night freak me out so bad that I can't sleep and I have to somehow find some sort of prescription drug to make it work. I could hear a scratching noise at my door recently. I'm hoping that things are going to improve before I get out of here, or hopefully at least hold off until I move. I plan to move back in with my parents in a few days' time. Wish me luck, because I sure as hell am going to need it. Like I said, when I first found that note, I thought it was just some sort of short scary story, maybe something that somebody had put there to scare people. But after I'm starting to experience these things myself, this story is starting to seem a little bit more real. It was the summer of 2007, and my best friend and his girlfriend suggested I get a date, and we go to some local hot spots, which are natural hot springs, located deep in a nearby canyon, not too far from where we lived in Utah. Supposedly, these hot spots were excellent, super quick and easy to get to. Just a short hike from where you would park your car off the main road, running through the canyon. So, it must have been around 7 p.m. that day when we parked the truck in a Spanish Fork Canyon and set off on the trail that led to the natural hot springs, armed with only our swimming suits and towels. I don't know where my friend got his lousy information. It wasn't a quick and easy hike, that's for sure. More like a challenging hike that took over an hour on a very narrow path, where we had to walk single file the entire time, and occasionally over some treacherous spots where one lousy step would send you cascading down the mountain. It seemed like it would never end, and we'd never get to those hot springs. But after wearing ourselves out and not being adequately prepared, we finally made it. The sun was setting as we finally reached the clearing where somebody dug up the natural pools. It was later than expected, but we figured it would be fun to soak in hot water underneath the stars. We were so deep in the canyon at this point that the stars in the sky were brighter than any other time I've seen them in my life. No light pollution at all. We had probably been there for about 30 minutes and had the entire area to ourselves, just having a great time telling jokes and making each other laugh. The only light was from the stars, and the only sounds were from us. The quiet was almost eerie. Suddenly, we started to hear twigs snapping in every direction. See, there was only one way in and out of the hot springs, though. That super narrow trail that we hiked in on, and that's where we were now hearing the loudest of the noise coming from. Soon, we could make out the outline of a figure in the dark, someone with a flashlight coming down the trailhead to the collections we were swimming in. I was in a great mood up until this point. Since this person's arrival had surprised us, I yelled out to them once I was confident that they would be able to hear me, to try and break the ice. I didn't want it to be awkward, and partly as a defense mechanism from the nervousness I was feeling suddenly. Hey, you here to join the party? Silence. The person keeps walking towards us and doesn't say a word. 
Immediately, alarm bells are going off in my head. My gut is telling me that something is not right here. I try to ignore how I'm feeling and joke to our group about the person being a weirdo for not answering, but now everyone is on edge. As the person gets closer, we can start to make out more details of this guy. It's a man, above average size, dressed head to toe in black. This guy was wearing a hoodie and long pants in the middle of summer in Utah. Who does that? We noticed he's also wearing a black backpack before he gets to the clearing and turns off his flashlight. He continues walking towards us though. Now, there are a half dozen hot spots scattered around this clearing. There is no one else around except us. He has his pick of any of them to swim in. But no, he walked directly towards ours and sits down about six feet away from us while we were soaking. My friend has a lantern, so he hops up to the side of the pool and grabs it and turns it on. Something strange is that it seemed like the stranger was doing something weird before we turned on the lantern. He was ruffling through his bag, looking for something. One of us says something to him, and once again we get no response. My friend temporarily turns off the lantern, I assume because it's on low battery, and he doesn't want to wear it out. But once the light is out, the stranger in black unzips his backpack again and starts frantically looking through it. My friend immediately turns the lantern back on. The stranger quickly stops, zips the bag back up, and is acting like nothing is happening. My friend notices the stranger appears to be Hispanic, and she greets him in Spanish, which catches the stranger off guard, and he mumbles a response. My friend asks how he is doing, and what he is up to tonight. Did he come for a swim? At least that's what I assume from his tone. I don't speak Spanish very well, so I don't know exactly what the stranger's responses were, but they were very brief and not very friendly sounding. After asking a few more questions to the guy, my friend turns to me and our dates in the pool and says very quietly, but deadly seriously, we need to go right now. Immediately we start getting out of the pool and drying off with our towels. The stranger asks my friend a question in Spanish, something like, oh, where are you guys going so quickly? And while I surmise my friend is playing it off very calmly and like it's no big deal, I know he definitely felt differently. Then, again, he turns to us and says, we're getting our things together and putting on our shoes. Maybe not going as fast as we could. We don't have time. Grab your stuff. We're going now. We don't ask questions. We grab our things and start practically running towards the trailhead as a group. As we look back, we see the stranger in black is getting his things together, getting up and starting to follow us. At this point, there is no illusion of what is happening. This guy has bad intentions and is chasing after us on this narrow trail all the way back to our vehicle. We know we have got an hour or more ahead of us until we are back to the safety of our car, and we don't have anything to defend ourselves with at all. We're still soaking wet. We've got a head start on him, which is a big help. I took the lantern and took the lead of the group. We got into a single file line and locked hands with each other, knowing that we would need it to keep moving as fast as we possibly could, but not too quickly, or we could fall to our deaths. The girls were behind me, with my friend at the back who was giving us updates of where the stranger in black was doing and telling us to move faster. He picked up the most prominent, the sharpest rock he could find and prepared to kill this guy if he had to. I'm sure you can imagine the emotions that were running through all of us at the time. Obviously nobody wanted to hurt anybody. The girls were sobbing, trying to keep pace with me up front. I'm yelling back, watch out for this, watch out for that, and we're making our way into the darkness as fast as we can. I'm telling myself to stay calm so I don't scare the girls any more than they already are. While I'm also feeling an overwhelming sense of dread that I don't really know how to handle. I don't want to die this young. I'm only 19 years old. After what feels like an eternity, we finally see the main canyon road in our truck. We all run towards it as my friend unlocks it. We all get inside and we're all in shock at this point and just start shaking uncontrollably. I tell my friend to start the car and start driving so we can get the hell out of here and never come back. I ask my friend, the one who is speaking Spanish to the stranger, why did you tell us to get out of there so quickly? My friend answered that he purposely had been turning the lantern on and off because he noticed, when he did, the stranger was searching in his bag for something. And when it came back on, the stranger closed it up fast and acted like he hadn't been looking for something. That was when he tried speaking in Spanish to get a feel for what was going on with the guy. My friend said that he was asking the stranger some questions in Spanish like, where are your friends? And the stranger answered, no friends, and other short answers to basic questions that gave my friend the absolute creeps. 
Once the stranger asked my friend something about the girls who were with us, that was when he told us we need to get out of there. He was able to see the stranger following us almost the entire time, but dropped off towards the end when he couldn't keep pace with us. So, what was the stranger doing in the middle of the dark canyon by himself, dressed in all black? What did he have in his bag that he was trying to get to, that he didn't want us to see? And what would have happened to us if he had caught up to our group on the trail that night? I'd hate to find out. Rescue on El Capitan Neil Olson On September 23rd, 1972, a breathtaking autumn sun began to rise over the majestic El Capitan. Casting long shadows within Yosemite Valley, the iconic granite monolith attracted climbers from all over the world. But on this particular day, all eyes were on Neil Olson and his climbing team. Neil was an experienced climber with a reputation for his technical skills. He was leading his group through one of the most challenging sections of the 24th pitch of the legendary Nose Route. The Nose was a celebrated climb renowned for its demanding features, steep walls, and sudden weather changes. Much had been written about its beauty and danger, and Neil knew this well. He had spent countless hours training and preparing for this moment. As he secured his gear and communicated with his team, a sense of camaraderie enveloped them. They were not just climbers. They were a family united by their passion for their mountains. As they ascended, the atmosphere changed rapidly. The serenity of the morning was abruptly interrupted by dark and heavy ominous clouds rolling in from the west. Neil and his team in high spirits continued their climb despite the unsettling weather. Sometime around noon, the first raindrops began to fall, but they pressed on, determined to complete the pitch. However, the rain quickly turned into torrential downpour, transforming the rock into a treacherous, slick surface. Mountains are capricious entities, and they offer no tributes to the ill-prepared. As slippery rocks gave way under the growing water weight, a sudden crack echoed throughout the valley. One of Neil's team members lost footing, sending a cascade of rock and debris down the pitch. Although the climber managed to grab the ledge, the fall shocked the group. Neil quickly assessed the situation, his heart racing. He recognized the precariousness of their position. Worsening conditions would complicate a rescue operation. Realizing that time was of the essence, he instructed the team to secure themselves as best they could while he checked on the struggling climber. Once he reached his teammates, Neil could see the panic in their eyes, but knew maintaining composure was vital. The rain continued to pour and the rocks were slicker than ever. We can't stay here, Neil shouted over the sound of the storm. We need to move to the next ledge. With a steady voice, he encouraged his teammates to focus on his instructions as he assisted in moving them carefully. Despite Neil's best efforts, reaching the next ledge took longer than expected. As they maneuvered, a loud crash echoed through the valley. A massive rock slide threatened the entire area. The other team members had managed to find safety, but the situation was now dire for Neil and his teammate. With limited visibility due to the rain and rapidly descending fog, they clung to hope and to each other. Outside, climbers and spectators in the valley below were becoming increasingly concerned. Word spread about the others still high on the wall. By late afternoon, the Yosemite search and rescue team mobilized. Fully aware of the challenging conditions they would have to face to save Neil and his team. As dusk settled over Yosemite, the rescuers deployed helicopters. Even as rain lashed against their efforts, they dropped supplies to the stranded climbers, offering food and warmth while technicians analyzed conditions from above. The air smelled of damp earth, and worry hung heavy, encapsulating the urgency. Meanwhile, Neil and his team clung to hope. We're not giving up, Neil said firmly, reassuring his partner that help was on the way. Every single moment felt like an eternity as they waited, the darkness creeping around them. 
wrapping them tightly as if the mountain sought to consume them. As night fell, the illuminating beams of searchlights pierced through the fog, igniting a flurry of hope among the rescue teams. Suddenly, overhead the chop of helicopter blades resonated, and they felt the vibration through the granite walls. The mission was alive, and the rescuers were searching for them. They beamed flashlights back toward the lights, desperate to signal their location. With renewed determination and guided by the rescuer signals, Neil and his partner began their descent to a safer ledge, barely able to see with rain still pouring. Each move was a delicate dance between assurance and fear. As they descended through the rocks, the ground beneath them finally steadied. When they reached a point where the rescuers could finally secure them, the salvation appeared like a beacon. A rope lowered from above, the lights illuminating the ledge, exhausted but safe. Neil and his teammates were hoisted up to safety, greeted by the relieved faces of the search and rescue team. Back on the ground, safe at last and drenched but alive, Neil and his team embraced each other. On that stormy day when nature unleashed its fury, their resolve carried them through and they emerged from the mountain with more incredible bonds than they had ever had before. That day, they learned not just about climbing prowess, but the strength of teamwork and the indomitable human spirit in the face of adversity. The Post at Pine Ridge The sun dipped below the horizon as I settled into my solitary post atop Pine Ridge, my home for the summer as a fire lookout worker. I enjoyed the isolation crisp mountain air, vibrant sunsets, and the occasional rustle of wildlife in the underbrush was a welcome reprieve from the chaos of the city. This was my sanctuary, a small cabin with a panoramic view of the forest stretching endlessly in every direction. As darkness enveloped the forest, I turned on my oil lamp, its warm glow flickering against the wooden walls. The radio crackled with static, a reminder that I was connected. However, tenuously to the world below. I kept my logbook nearby, jotting down the day's observations and checking in with the ranger station. All clear, I reported, feeling a sense of pride in my responsibility. But tonight felt different. A dense fog rolled in as the sun sank, creeping up the trees like a ghost, swallowing the last hints of daylight. I peered through my binoculars, scanning the sprawling woods that now seemed to swirl with shadows. The sound of rustling leaves filled the air, louder than before, as if the forest was alive and whispering secrets I couldn't quite decipher. Around midnight, my ease exploded into full-blown terror. It started subtly, a flicker at the edge of my vision. I turned quickly. Convinced I'd see an animal or perhaps the wind playing tricks on me, but there was nothing there. I returned to my logbook, dismissing it as fatigue. Sleep had been elusive these past few nights, and the shadowy edges of my mind were beginning to fray. Then, the first cold bump echoed through the cabin. I held my breath. It was followed by two more deliberate and rhythmic thumps. Someone. Something was knocking on the wooden exterior of the lookout. Goosebumps prickled my skin as I glanced around, my heart pounding. The sound was organized, almost as if it was trying to get my attention. Hello? I called out, trying to sound unafraid. Is anyone there? Silence. Yet the knocking resumed, louder, more insistent, each thwack resonating through my bones. I peered out the small window straining to see through the fog. The trees loomed like sentinels, blocking any trace of movement. Was it the wind, an animal testing the boundaries of my sanity? I returned to my desk, telling myself I was alone, and began to write again, hoping to drown out the sounds. But then, I heard a soft voice whispering my name, barely audible over the howling wind. Claire. Chills cascaded down my spine. My name echoed in the emptiness, its source lost to the night. Who's there? I exclaimed, panic rising in my throat. Show yourself! 
The answer came as the cabin violently shook, rattling to the very foundation. The knocking morphed into thunderous blows as if something immense were trying to break through the walls. I leapt to my feet, gripping the table for stability, the lantern's flame dancing wildly, threatening to extinguish. Stop it, I shouted, eyes wide and frantically searching for anything to explain this madness. In my mind, I replayed every horror story I had ever heard about fire lookouts. Ghosts of past rangers, lost souls wandering the woods, seeking revenge. I couldn't let those stories control me. I had to remain calm, but the voices grew louder, overlapping, and a cacophony filled my ears. Claire, Claire help, help us. us. We're trapped. We're trapped. I stumbled back, heart racing, terror flooding my senses. The air grew thick and heavy, the temperature dropping as if I had entered a tomb. Against my better judgment, I opened the door, desperate to confront whatever had invaded my sanctuary. The fog swirled in, cold and biting, wrapping around me like icy fingers. Show yourself, I yelled into the void, but all I saw was the intimidating silhouettes of trees, their branches reaching out like skeletal hands clutching at the sky. Then, in the dense fog, I spotted them. Figures emerging silently, pale and translucent. Their faces were etched with anguish and fear. They moved slowly toward me, mere shadows in the night, but their eyes were piercing. I could feel their sorrow deep within my chest. Please, help us, one whispered, echoing inside my skull. I stepped back, stumbling over the threshold, my breath hitching. What happened to you? I asked, desperation spilling from my lips. Trapped. The voice reverberated a mournful chant that resonated with the wood's essence. We cannot leave. You must help us. The figures advanced, and I could feel their pain washing over me like a wave. I realized then that they were lost souls, perhaps victims of past fires or tragedy, forever haunting this landscape. I wanted to run, to lock the door, but a force held me in place, compelling me to listen. Tears filled my eyes as I searched for words, something to ease their suffering. What can I do? I asked, voice trembling. They, they seemed to unite in a whisper, but I couldn't understand it. Something about breaking a barrier. Their voices, a haunting melody that wrapped around my heart. The weight of their collective grief bore down on me, and I thought about the fire season, the control towers, and what I had learned. That the woods were fragile, their spirits woven into the fabric of nature. The only way to help them, I realized, was through acknowledgement of their existence, an understanding of the life and the death that occurred in the very tree surrounding me. Heart pounding, I returned to the cabin, moved to the center of the room, and declared, I see you, I hear you, I acknowledge your pain. I repeated it over and over, my voice carrying into the emptiness, the shadows swirling around me. Slowly, their forms began to dissolve, warmth flooding the air, and the sorrow in their voices faded into a gentle, whispering breeze. The voices turned into a murmur and then slowly drifted away, leaving the cabin unbothered by their long haunting presence. As dawn broke, the fog lifted, and I could see the sprawling expanse of the forest. Exhausted yet somehow relieved, I took a deep breath, knowing that Pine Ridge would always carry the weight of those lost souls, even as it stood guard over the living. Some nights as I sit alone in my lookout, I hear the rustle of leaves and whispers in the wind, a reminder of that chilling night. I learn to listen not just to my ears but with my heart, and sometimes, when I'm in solitude, with my mind. The cries of the lost became an echo of hope, and to those willing to hear, you should always remember, there are strange things in this world, but sometimes a small a little bit of compassion can make everything okay, at least for the time being. My name is Rob. For the past few years, I've held the position of Deputy Team Leader at the Brecon Mountain Rescue Team here in Wales. The BMRT is an essential emergency service in rural Wales, staffed entirely by volunteers and funded entirely by donations from the National Lottery. 
and members of the public. Our work is not just restricted to mountain or wilderness search and rescue for climbers and hill walkers. Our skills are also deployed by the Welsh police to search for vulnerable or missing persons on assignments where we can employ our specialist medical and rescue techniques. I've seen some pretty wild things during my time in the rescue team, some of which may be more distressing or disturbing than others, some more than I'd care to admit. But there's only been one incident in my entire career that myself or my colleagues have not been able to fully explain. This is the story of that incident. Mountain rescue teams can only be called on the authority of the police. A call is normally initiated by the local force in response to a 999 call or the report of a missing person. The team can be and is usually called out at any time of day or night under any conditions, even on New Year's Day and Christmas Day. The relevant police personnel will initially alert the rescue team by means of a pager message. A little outdated, I know, but it reflects the slimmer than slim budget we're forced to work with year in, year out. Once the volunteers receive their I will respond message, the ball gets rolling. A team leader or a deputy team leader will then discuss the details of the incident with the coordinating police officers and decide an appropriate rendezvous point and if any additional assets need to be deployed. These can include additional teams, tracker dogs, or even helicopter support if the situation calls for one to be deployed. So I'm sitting in the Drover's Arms pub with a few mates, having just finished watching one of their younger brothers represent their high school in a rugby sevens match. Their team won. So, spirits are high. We've just finished some dinner, and I'm about to get stuck into my first pint of the evening, when my beeper goes off. I won't lie, I was a bit annoyed. I'd really been looking forward to that pint, but we're explicitly told to expect things like that. Such is life of a mountain rescue volunteer. Anyway, I let the lads know I had to leave, put my coat on, and began to take the 10 minute walk up to the small set of offices that serve as the BMRT headquarters. It's early on a Sunday night. Most calls seem to happen around holidays and weekends, and the place is empty. So I unlock the door to turn on all the lights, and walk down to my office to phone the police liaison's officer to get all the necessary details. As I'm talking to the officer in question, my phone starts lighting up with text messages from various other team members, telling me they're on their way. Everything was coming together nicely, and the situation seemed to be like usual. Basic search and rescue job. A couple of hikers went up into the hills on Saturday, intending to camp overnight before heading back down on Sunday afternoon. According to the person who had called it in, the hikers hadn't returned on schedule, nor were they answering any of their phones. So they called us. Now, on more than one occasion we've gotten calls from members of the public reporting missing people who weren't actually missing at all. Sometimes, groups are slowed down by dodgy ankles or an upset tummy or, you know, something like that. I get why someone might panic, and it's always better to be safe than sorry. That's why the BMRT exists in the first place. So it's always, always helps when the person making the call knows a little bit about the missing person's group. Especially if they know the intended route, so we can retrace or follow it to the best of our, you know, ability. That'll help us potentially find them nice and quickly too. If we can focus our search, we don't need helicopter support, which saves us a huge amount of money. I know that sounds callous, but we really do live and die on our funding so it's essential we keep the purse strings tight. So, I'm going through all the core details with the liaison officer, determining where the group most likely started their trek. So, I'm going through all the core details with the liaison officer, determining the group's most likely whereabouts, trying to figure out where they started and where they could have gotten lost. We go through all the usual stuff, just like normal then move on to the miscellaneous details that can often aid a search. These can include any medical conditions that might bring the persons into difficulty, age ranges, and things of that nature. You'd be amazed how tiny, seemingly insignificant details can help with the search. So it's extremely important that we compile as much information as possible as quickly as possible. 
Only when I pressed the liaison officer for more information regarding the emergency call itself, she became awful cagey. Very little in the way of detailed information could be passed along regarding the missing group. The only significant detail is that the woman who had reported them missing was absolutely distraught when she did so. The dispatcher had noted that no matter what she did or said, she could not seem to reassure the caller that their loved ones would be found. The caller seemed convinced that the group of hikers was gone and never coming back. Honestly, it's stuff like this that kept me in the BMRT for so long. Being the hero that people so desperately need at what for many is the lowest point of their lives thus far. Less than an hour after the initial beeper messages, myself and four additional volunteers had converged at the BMRT HQ, ready to begin our search. Our route would take us over 16 miles of hills and mountains, roughly five hours of solid walking but it was likely we'd find the missing group of hikers in a fraction of that time. At least that's what we told ourselves initially. We did find something relatively quickly. After only 45 minutes worth of hiking up gently sloping trails, but it didn't fill us with confidence. In fact, it did the very opposite. We found a tent, an empty, abandoned tent. Being a BMRT volunteer sometimes means you're basically a detective. You can use small pieces of a puzzle to build up a larger picture of an overall situation. What we had before us was an empty two-man tent, but we were looking for a total of four missing hikers. What was clear was that whoever had set this tent up had been easily able to make it down into the Brecken to report an emergency. Only, they hadn't. They had apparently gone back up the trail. But why would they do such a thing? This escaped us completely. This was the first really worrying sign as well. But what was obvious is that they had done so without even wearing their hiking boots. So they had climbed up the mountain barefoot in the middle of the night. That's definitely not good. This happened to be in the middle of March, not the coldest month of the year, but one which brings strong winds to central Wales. Wind chill can lower ambient temperatures by almost half and tend to be the cause of most cases of hypothermia we encounter. A hiker can look outside, see a sunny day, and assume fine weather. But once they're up a mountain, the wind can drop the temperature into a single digit and turn seemingly benign situations into a deadly one. But it wasn't just hiking boots that had been left behind, either. A fair amount of cold weather clothing had been left behind in the tent along with what appeared to be a significant amount of food and water. It was at that point that any hope of getting through this rescue without having to call in a helicopter support went right out the window. Whoever was lost out here needed help and quickly. So we called it in, and within a few minutes, a search and rescue helicopter had taken off from Neville Hall Hospital with the intention of flying the length of our proposed route. Our eye in the sky was on its way, it was fully dark with no stars by the time we made the call, and shortly afterward we began to see red and white flashing lights moving westward in the sky ahead of us. The helicopter's pilot and I exchanged greetings as they tuned into our radio frequency, and I kept in touch with them as best as possible as we advanced along our route. What's more, it didn't take long before the co-pilot spotted something unusual just about a mile or so ahead of us. According to the helicopter's crew, they had spotted a person running along one of the mountain trails in the opposite direction we were heading. They had tracked the individual's movement for a moment or two, before losing sight of them around a set of standing stones. There were over 30 standing stones in the Beacons National Park. Some of them are many centuries old and reaved in myth. It isn't known exactly how many of the surviving standing stones are prehistoric. Some appear to be memorial stones and others, well, they seem to have had more than one function, either as a boundary marker, waymark on ancient trails, signposts, or even rubbing stones for livestock. But whatever their purpose was, we had our next rendezvous point. One that we would have to reach quickly if we hoped to find our missing persons in good health. It took about 45 minutes of hard hill climbing before we reached the standing stones. They formed a high, rough circle 
about five huge chunks of granite, worn and misshapen by the elements. According to the helicopter's crew, the person they had been tracking had run off the trail and into the standing stones before disappearing from view. It was more likely that the helicopter had simply let the person slip out of their searchlight and lost track of them. But why a person in peril would run away from the rescue chopper and not towards it was a complete and utter mystery to us. I mean, yeah, stranger things have happened on previous rescue attempts, but this little conundrum certainly left us scratching our head as we began to search for clues as to where the person might have headed to next. After a minute or two of combing the area, with only our personal torches for light, one of the many team members called over to me. Behind this standing stone, set into a little hillock that obscured from view, was a small opening in the earth. I say small, but it was just big enough for a fully grown adult to climb inside. And what was clear was that it was the perfect place for someone to hide in. And it would be a perfect place to, you know, get away from the biting wind and rain. I stuck my torch inside the opening and peered inside, only then just seeing how deep the passageway seemed to go. Wales used to be a hub for the British coal mining industry and the country is now littered with disused mining pits and shafts, both ancient and modern. Knowing this full well, the underground passage didn't strike me as unusual at first, and I actually thought the missing hikers were lucky that they might have come across something like this to shelter them. I called out down the opening, checking to see if anyone had slipped down the tunnel and had gotten themselves stuck whilst trying to take a shelter or something like that. I received no reply. I then called over to one of the other team members who had happened to carry the majority of our climbing ropes. We harnessed him up, staked climbing pegs into the earth just outside the entrance and began to lower him into the opening to check for signs of life. We lowered him down so far into the earth that I began to worry about the prospect of getting him stuck, but thankfully we didn't have to lower him any further before he found something. He called out for us to pull him up alerting us that he had found an item of clothing that possibly belonged to one of our missing hikers. So we did just that. We pulled him back up, took the item of clothing from him, and lowered him back down to continue looking. As he did so, I took a quick look at the jumper he had brought up and was struck by something unusual about it. It looked old, really old. Clothing exposed to the elements for long periods can end up looking pretty rough, but not that rough. It appears as though it had been stuck down in that hole for far too long. We didn't find anything else down that hole, or the rest of the mountain. We stayed up there until about 3 in the morning, long after our helicopter support had to withdraw due to dwindling fuel. But we didn't find a single thing. No more clothes, no more signs of life, and no more bodies. The more it became clear that we weren't going to find anything, the more I thought about how the distress caller seemed convinced that the hikers were gone. She had no way of knowing that whatsoever, yet somehow, she was right. And that really didn't sit right with me, at all. Throughout the next week, two more search parties took to the hills in hopes of finding a trace of our missing hikers. Both came back empty-handed. I expected reports of the missing hikers to appear in local news publications, only they didn't. When I tried to find out why, I was turned away by most police sources until one slip that a judge at the High Court of England and Wales had placed a publication ban on the incident, meaning an order prohibiting publication under Section 11 of the Contempt of Court Act in 1981 was in fact, keeping all news of the incident out of newspapers. But that's not what really bothers me about this whole thing. I mean, it's been confounding, sure, but it's another peculiar detail surrounding the case, and it keeps me up at night. The name stitched into the jumper we found down that hole in the earth was Robert Williams. I came to find out that this didn't match any of the names we had been given regarding Tormis and hikers. In fact, Robert Williams had been missing from a nearby town of Neath since March of 2002. 17 years before our missing hikers were reported. Who was it that our helicopter support had spotted before they disappeared among the standing stones? Was it one of our missing hikers, or was it, in fact, the long-lost Robert Williams? Regardless, I can't help but think I find the answers to these questions at the bottom of that tunnel hidden somewhere among those standing stones.